Uh, our next lecturer is uh, a, a wealth of knowledge in, in terms of uh, coffee production in Kenya. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer for the Coffee Board of Kenya. Uh, she is a specialist in agricultural value chains management. Um, she has served in the coffee industry uh, in various capacities for the last 18 years. Uh, therefore, she obviously has an extensive working experience with both public and private sectors of coffee. Um, at this year's Nordic Barista Cup, she will be uh, talking about the trade of Kenyan coffee. Uh, so please, uh, a big, hearty welcome for our next speaker, Wanjira Njeru. part of this very big event and a uh, very exciting event. I, I chose to sit at the back there because uh, I'm really just amazed at how much there is to learn about coffee. Being on the production side, sometimes you miss a lot on what is going on on the real uh, side. And I was just imagining how the coffee farmers in Kenya, if they were to sit here and partake or uh, listen to all this debate, I think they'll be motivated the way I've gotten motivated. There's so much to, to discover, and uh, really that's very good. I've also learned another thing, one very great thing. I agree with my Kenyan counterparts when we go back. Uh, the kind of welcome, you know, I thought Africans, we knew how to say it, but no. <laughs> I, I think that's one of my biggest learning about how you welcome your, your, your speakers. It's really heartwarming. So thank you very much. and. Uh, Let's get moving. Can, uh, when I talk about the coffee trade, uh, I'm really not the expert in that area. I've got big uh, trade houses represented in this uh, meeting from Kenya. And so I'll be looking at just the, uh, the, the, the government side or the public uh, sector side, how the government facilitates or organizes the industry. So... I'll start off by just giving you a sneak preview of where Kenya is in the big uh, world of Africa. Uh, we pride ourselves as being at the heart of Africa. And truly, if you look at where Kenya is located, that is uh, JKIA is our international airport with connections all over. We truly are the heart of Africa. So I'm looking forward to welcoming those who will be coming over and uh, those who will be coming later on, if not through the Barista event. Then uh, just a small uh, uh, preview of the country. Uh, Kenya lies uh, astride the equator, and that's significant of uh, us when we come to talk about our agriculture and in coffee, coffee in particular. Many times uh, everybody wonders uh, where, what makes the good quality. We believe it's our geopositioning. We are astride the uh, equator on the eastern coast, like you've already seen on the other map. We are on a strategic location, and we are the gateway to the continent. Our climatic conditions, which uh, we are endowed with as a country, I will not belabor much because my colleague who talked about the agronomy said most of these things. But just to appreciate uh, our equatorial and tropical location, and of course uh, the equator I've like already said, our climatic conditions, when you look at the temperatures in the coffee growing areas, Everybody thinks about Africa being very hot. Our coffee growing areas, we can do well. I was uh, looking through the internet to see the temperatures and between Copenhagen and Nairobi, even this morning, they seem to be very comparable. So uh, our, our, our temperatures are, are quite cool. And, and of course, uh, this is our coolest season. We could say this is our winter. <laughs> so so we are, when you're enjoying your winter, we have our summer. Uh, you have your summer and uh, temperatures not too, uh, the too, too hot or too cold, and we have a range of uh, about 19 degrees in the coffee growing areas. Kenya has fascinating tourist attractions. So when you think Kenya, I don't want you to just think about uh, coffee alone. We have a number of iconic uh, products. I'm from an investment summit in London where we were marketing Kenya, and so I think it's fresh in my mind, the tourist attractions, the tea also, uh, but don't drink tea, yeah? Let's take coffee. <laughs> so, the wildlife, the beaches, the safaris, everything you can think about 
uh, as a tourist. So when you come and enjoy the great cup of coffee, you'll be in the right place with the sandy beaches, with everybody. My colleague yesterday talked about those beaches, not those ones, white sandy beaches. Okay, you know, long kilometers of it and uh, the, the sun. So very beautiful country. Kenya has excellent international connections to any city you can think of in Europe, in US. And uh, yeah, that's the place to be. Where is Kenya? I mean, where is the coffee growing then in this great country? I'm describing, I'm marketing to you. And uh, those are the coffee growing areas. Uh, same map, different script from my colleagues, the agronomists. Uh, you, you can t take note of the green areas where we have the main coffee growing areas. Um, the central area you can see between Nyeri, Roiro, Embu, that's the major coffee growing areas, about 85% of our coffee is grown within that region. Then uh, the western area, one of the coffees we sampled yesterday, the Bungoma area, you can see a name called Kitale on the other extreme side. Uh, around there, that's where that coffee came from, near the Uganda border. Uh, of course, we have very good coffees as well from the Kisi area. Uh, the Blue Mountain, we have a bit of the Blue Mountains around there, although somebody is thinking we're infringing the rights of Blue Mountains. We don't market it as Blue Mountain, but we know we have that from our old uh, plantings. And uh, like I said, the main growing area is here. We have huge potential. The worry has been there is a bit of urbanization here with uh, Nairobi becoming a big met metropolis and uh, quite a very fast pace of uh, urbanization. But we have extremely large uh, chunks of land around this area, as I'll be uh, discussing as we go on. So uh, we can talk about coffee marketing in Kenya without looking at the history. I think uh, we, must, we may be the only country in the world which has the longest history of uh, uh, coffee, a very organized coffee industry. Uh, coffee first planted in uh, 1893, like uh, my colleague the agronomist said, and research services dating back to 1809. Really a long history of very well organized industry. The coffee board for marketing was established in 1933, I mean uh, as a regulatory body in 1933, uh, while the, whereas the marketing board came in 1946. Thereafter, there's been a lot of uh, dynamics changes within the organization, uh, liberalization has set in, and uh, in 1971, the, the functions of the two organizations, that's the regulator and the marketing board were for, brought into one, but uh, in 1992, the, there was the introduction, there was further liberalization or the organization of the industry. Previously, coffee was sold in Kenya shillings, and uh, in 1992, we saw the selling of coffee in dollars, and again, of what we, or what we call out of pool. Before, every coffee was uh, bulked together and sold as a, as a pool, but uh, from 1992 or thereabout, uh, the direct, I mean, the out of pool, where coffees were sold by lots, uh, w was introduced. Again, giving ourselves a bit of uh, distinctiveness of our, our products and also traceability. In 1996, we saw the introduction of, uh, uh, I mean, an end to the milling monopoly uh, with the introduction of more milling uh, entities. That's the dry mills. When I talk of milling, I'm talking of dry mills. Then uh, in uh, 19, I mean, the 2001, the marketing and regulatory functions done by the coffee board was uh, privatized and uh, the board's role was redefined only as a promoter and marketer. Uh, in again 2006, we introduced the what we call the direct sales to long uh, to, to run alongside the the, the, the auction system. So fr from 1933, the first auction bell rang, and uh, I mean uh, in 1935, sorry, and then uh, in 19 in, in 2006, we got the direct sales uh, coming along as uh, an alternative option of coffee selling. Or coffee trading. So how then does, uh, how do we produce, how is the industry organized in terms of production? And uh, again, my colleague did talk quite a bit of this, that we have uh, uh, about 140,000 hectares. We are expecting this figure to be reviewed downwards. We are undertaking a validation exercise. 
because there has been a lot of other developments within the coffee growing areas, and that's why I'm emphasizing the potential for expanding our growing areas to the western side. Uh, we have a, an estimated between 600 and 700,000 uh, smallholder and about uh, 4,000 uh, uh, small estates. And estates in this case may start from uh, two hectares and onwards. And we estimate that uh, 5 million Kenyans depend or draw their livelihoods from coffee. So a very significant uh, activity. The numbers may not be big in terms of what comes to the country, but uh, because of the decline in production over time, uh, we estimate that 5% of our GDP is uh, from coffee. It can be better uh, because our production currently oscillates at about 50,000 metric tons, which is uh, not our best ever. Our best ever stands at about 130,000 metric tons. We still have the potential to bounce back to that production, especially if the pace of prices and uh, the discussions I've had this morning and yesterday about rewarding quality, we can live to that. I think we, we Kenya, because Kenya coffee is uh, high in terms of cost of production, and so remunerating the farmer is key to sustaining the productivity. So again, uh, the varieties, the where the altitudes and the harvesting seasons, I'll speak that because my colleague did talk about it. Just to give you a sneak preview of the value chain, the coffee value chain in Kenya, the supply chain. So we have down there the cooperative society. I mean, we have the, yeah, the farmers, the smallholder farmers formed in cooperative societies like I've already alluded to. Then the small estates, the two acres to about, uh, two hectares to about uh, 25 or so hectare, I mean hectares. The large estates diminishing a bit quite fast. That's where most of the urbanization is taking place, especially the ones near the Nairobi town. Uh, then the dry mills, goes to the dry mills. Uh, um, the, from the dry mills, then the marketing agents uh, take over the produce and present it to the auction system, I mean to the, to the auction floor or the, uh, the exchange. Then from the auction exchange, then the dealers or exporters then they buy their coffee and they either export or go uh, sell to the domestic market or for exporters uh, value added. That's the auction system. Then on the other side, we have the direct sales system. Again, Sorry. <laughs> the, the direct sales uh, really is a relationship bind between the farmer yeah, and an exporter. I mean, a, a consumer rather, uh, an export market somewhere, a consumer somewhere. And uh, the obvious thing we see is that this is a, a shorter chain yeah, compared to this long chain and uh, we'll be seeing why we, we, we chose to go that way. So, this is a beautiful coffee plantation in Kenya, so come, come and see it. <laughs> From one of the big estates, yeah? There's something I've still not introduced. Nobody has noted this, yeah? <laughs> Have you? <laughs> it can only be so rich, so Kenyan, yeah? So th th that's a typical uh, big estate, monoculture. Somebody talk, uh, talked about it yesterday. And uh, we are thinking also the, the kind of uh, production system under the estates. I think shading is the way to go for sustainability. Uh, some cherries, I think they are better than the ones we saw from Colombia in the morning. <laughs> I don't take responsibility for that blank one. I don't know what happened. There was a slide. Sorry. Yeah, there was one which was uh, sorting and all. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry about that. Uh, just the same processes we saw yesterday. Then that is uh, drying of the parchment in the sun. And uh, then the, the clean coffee. So Kenya. I hope the color <laughs> comes out nicely. Okay, so 
j just to again recap the, the, the stages of the coffee process goes through. And uh, that process is what gives us what we are calling uniquely Kenyan. And uh, we, we've launched a mark of uh, origin, the coffee Kenya, so it's so Kenyan. And we are saying it's so Kenyan because it's grown, grown under those unique Kenyan conditions we've described. Uh, it's done by hard, from picking to sorting to processing. I liked, uh, forgotten the name again, sorry. The, when you talked about the Colombian and every time the reference, the cross reference was Kenya. So really this is it, <laughs> yeah. It's done by ha hand, uh, the picking, the, uh, the sorting, the processing, the washing, you know, the fermenting, washing, all those processes you know of. And then so rich Kenyan because of its unique, uh, outstanding, extraordinary characteristics, acidity, flavor, body, aroma, and you, 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 you have all the descriptions. I don't even have as good descriptions as you all of you here have. So how has the industry performed despite that good story about the quality and all? Oil has not been rosy. Um, that is uh, our performance, but let me show it in a tabular form. I mean, in a graphic form. And n not something to smile, to smile about. We can only smile about our quality, but our, our production has been uh, on a downward decline. Uh, we'll be discussing, and I know those are some of the questions I'm expecting to hear from this panel, well, from the panel debate. That uh, no, something's happening to my presentation. Sorry, because that one again is gone. Yeah, we, we can go back and uh, just see the table. I'm really sorry about that. So we've been uh, on an upward trend, you know, from uh, 19, I mean, 07, 08, marginal jump. Uh, we made a good uh, jump. This is in Kenya shillings, so uh, well, we can give you an idea. Then uh, last year was our best year in a long time, and uh, we 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 were both uh, we both saw this out of uh, a poor a weak Kenya shilling and also good uh, international prices. So this year we are expecting to get there because our production is forecast to be at uh, 50 50,000 metric tons. Uh, indications we have now, because we're just about a month to the end of the year, is actually true. We'll make it to the 50,000 mark. And uh, the prices, because of the depressed prices, like we all know, will be just about there. Sorry about the graph, which uh, we lost there. And uh, so that brings me to coffee trading. Uh, the central auction, like uh, I've said, the two systems, the central auction and the and the direct sales, so I'll start with the central auction system. Uh, a bit of the... Now what has happened? Tim. Sorry, sorry about that. So, I don't want to go so much into the history because I've already alluded to that. Uh, but I just want to begin at where uh, our markets begin. Uh, we are saying that Europe is uh, our biggest market and that's significant for us being here today. Uh, and out of that 70%, uh, about half of that, comes to the Scandinavian countries. Um, however, appealing to Denmark to increase their volumes from Kenya. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite low. I don't want to mention the figures, <laughs> the numbers. Although uh, as a Scandinavian uh, country, uh, about 35, about half percent of uh, 70 percent really is, uh, comes here. The about 30 or so goes to uh, Germany. Uh, there is a lot of uh, room for improving, of course, the, 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 the volumes. Then see, after the 
after the, 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 the introduction, I mean after 2002, is currently not managed by the board, but by the industry. So my colleagues who will be with me in the panel will be the best place to answer some of the questions about the trading floor, because they are the ones managing the trading floor. I'm just an overseer as, as a regulator. But we work together very closely. That's why we are all here to, to, together for this uh, meeting. Uh, the KCPA, the KCPTA, the Kenya Coffee Traders and Producers Association is the current manager of the coffee trading sample room, trade sample room, and they also oversee the auctioning at the trading floor. Uh, the auctions are held every Tuesday uh, of the week, and unless when on recess, that usually in August and December. And there are currently about seven dry mills, the ones which process the coffee for onward uh, sale to, to, to op, or, you know, taking over to the, to, to the NCE. We have eight commercial marketing agents. Commercial marketing agents are the ones who sell the coffee on behalf of the farmers. And we have over 95 dealers who are licensed by the board. Out of the 95 dealers, uh, maybe about uh, 40 or so are the most active. But when somebody satisfies the conditions for licensing, we give them a chance. Some, of course, trade is, uh, coffee trade is very complicated. Uh, go for a year or more before making a, a sale. And so, although the numbers are high, the actually active ones are, are quite few. Marketing agents, their role is to, to link up with the millers, get uh, mark, uh, samples, uh, forward them to the auction trade 10 days before the auction. Then the, the dealers then would sample the coffee, the, I mean sample the coffees, uh, and then prepare of course for their bids uh, on, the, on, the, on the auction day. Uh, some may opt to solicit pre-auction bids uh, from overseas, which of course generates uh, competitiveness. Each marketing agent then would prepare a catalog and then uh, which are available to dealers and other interested parties at, at, the, at the same time. Trading is conducted in accordance to rules which govern the trading floor. Like I've said, it's independent of the government and is uh, done by the industry themselves. The auctions are carried out through an electronic bidding system uh, with a large dis uh, display panel and uh, Everybody bids, of course, by pressing the buttons and the best person for the day wins. Marketing agents and producers set reserve prices in consultation with their farmers. And, uh, of course, that remains the secret of the marketing agent and the farmer until the bid is uh, sealed. Um, the, if the coffee, if, uh, if in an auction coffee is uh, provided um, or is a... Uh, is brought and it doesn't attract a, a bid, then of course it's reoffered later on. Or if the bid is not confirmed for whatever reason, then it is reoffered uh, thereafter. If a bid is sealed, then payment should be done according to the law, according to the Coffee Act, within the seven dates, what we call the prompt date. Coffee remains the property of a farmer. It's important to say, to, to say this. And I had that uh, also for the Colombian uh, model until it is fully paid for. So at that point is uh, when it is bidded for and paid for, the exchange of the money, uh, or, or, or I mean of the warrants, then the coffee then exchange ha exchanges the hands. Uh, not too good, that's uh, uh, the, uh, okay, the auction floor. Uh, the bidding screen you can see on the background, uh, not very clear, and the person monitoring it. So it is like where I'm standing and you on the other side as the being the ones who are doing the bidding. So just a very simple uh, uh, flow. Then the other system I alluded to is good for, uh, is the direct sales system, which came into being uh, in 206, like I've indicated. And uh, it was motivated by what was seen as the need to shorten the, the chain between the producer and the buyer. And uh, also uh, a persuasion that it was going to repatriate more returns to the farmers. So direct sales uh, runs alongside the auction system. And uh, if you see by the numbers uh, of how much is going through either system, uh, it's not still a challenge to the auction system. And in fact, it was not meant to be. The, the two are meant to support one another so that uh, they, they can improve the competitiveness 
uh, of the process of the trading in coffee. Direct sales are normally conducted through contracts between a grower, it must be strictly a grower, uh, and an overseas buyer, and then the contract is launched with the board. The price offered under the direct sales must essentially be higher to justify the need for it, because there are logistical costs and uh, uh, you know issues around it, and so if if it's really justifiable, then it should be uh, priced better off, and that was the, the reason for it. Only growers, like I've uh, indicated, can qualify for a license. I mean, for uh, for licensing, and a grower in this case we we define them as either a cooperative society or a plantation uh, farmer, a farmer who is producing their coffee. Of course, one of the most limiting thing is the volumes. Some of the small planters cannot uh, just, uh, qualify for that export, grower export license because of the, number, the volumes. The perceived benefits for the systems, that is the direct uh, the system, is the establishment of farmer-buyer relationships, uh, empowering farmers with market information and decision making so that they can have hands on in terms of dealing coffee. Uh, shortening the supply chain, that, uh, like I've already alluded to, and then feedback between farmer and buyer and seller. And uh, the, the, the case in point of the Colombian uh, farmer, I think, is a, is a good way of kind of bridging that gap. So that's what is anticipated under the direct sales. And of course, finally, the, the value capture. And of course, the, the value capture, because uh, if the whole system doesn't then make sense in terms of higher returns, then it's no good. But we all know the dynamics in coffee marketing. So sometimes you may come up uh, with a good contract, but before you know it, the new the, the prices are changing and uh, farmers get disgruntled. Farmers are, you know, uh, and uh, so sometimes break the promises. Challenges in the system. We have still less than 10% of the coffee currently still sold uh, under this system, which means over 90% is still under the auction system. By its very nature, coffee marketing is complex and hence the, the, the low uptake, because it's the ordinary farmer, the cooperative society farmers who we are asking to get involved in this very complex game. Uh, Kenya also, the cooperative system has really evolved over time. Uh, I had a chance to visit uh, Ethiopia last year and uh, I was surprised the, the size of corporate societies. They have volumes which you know, may make, make sense for them to hire you know, somebody who can do the logistics of export and all. But the Kenyan cooperative societies are still uh, are, are very small in relative terms. Uh, over time, there have been a lot of uh, subdivision within the corporate society, so making them a bit less economical units. And uh, until recently, we, we got a, a, a national cooperative union coming together, trying to maybe uh, p make it possible for them to, to, to export. The Kenya co cooperative exporters, cooperative exporters, coffee cooperative exporters, which would be play, playing the role of uh, those of you who know coffee industry in Kenya, a bit the, the former KPCU. So bringing the cooperatives together. Uh, of course, the other challenge is the consistency of volumes and quality, like, like I'm alluding to because of the size of the societies or the size of the growers. The system, however, has no doubt introduced some form of uh, competition uh, with the central auction, especially for high quality coffees. Just ignore the blanks, they were not meant to be. So here uh, I'm trying to show the export destinations of uh, Kenyan coffee. Uh, unfortunately, Denmark will not be here <laughs> as a country. Like I indicated, the volumes are quite small. So it would be under the others, other countries which are lumped up together here. Uh, it's unique to find uh, countries like India, you know, among others, becoming part of the buyers of Kenya coffee, but those are the dynamics in the coffee world today. Uh, that was the, uh, that was 2010-11. So it's true, I lost, I lost some information. I don't know how I lost the information. I had the, the other table here, but unfortunately it looks like 
we, we didn't come through with the team when we were looking through to see whether everything was good. Sorry about that. But uh, the, the table was, I mean, the pie chart was more or less this, with the Germany leading, usually between 20, I mean, for Europe, between 25 and 30, uh, and the others more or less in the same uh, ratios. So, as I conclude, I just wanted to make a, give a highlight of some major players in the coffee industry, uh, in the trade side, uh, actually in the, in the value chain, the NKG group, the Ecom uh, and Agro Industrial Group, the EDF and MAN, uh, the ED and F MAN group, uh, and Samia group. So those are the key players in the industry. Uh, some of them, of course, I mean, most of them uh, with the uh, representative of international big companies. What are the market perceptions about Kenya coffee? Thought I should just share this with you. Unfortunately, Kenya, like most of other African countries, except Ethiopia, we, we don't take our own coffee. And we recently have started on a journey of educating uh, farmers about the good quality of Kenya coffee. So this slide was actually meant for a, a domestic market promotion activity, but I thought it's a good one to just share here so that it can trigger our thinking. But uh, I think having sat in the back and listened, I think we, you will all agree with me. These perceptions are correct, downloaded from the internet. Yeah? Today, Kenya owns one of the most celebrated uh, coffee origins. Sets it aside for the standard of food production in processing. I think it was even replayed and restated as uh, we were hearing the presentation. And all and all and all, I think that was just like I said, for a different audience, but I thought maybe I can just also flash it to us. So where do we go from here? We recognize that the sector has the potential to contribute to, to contribute better to the livelihoods of more Kenyans and the economy as a whole. Uh, we are at about 5% GDP contribution from the industry. During the, 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 the 70s, we were doing 40%. So we still have the potential because we still have the infrastructure in terms of the land, in terms of the investment in the industry, and uh, to, to unlock the potential of our design constraints. I mean, we need to just unlock the, un unlock the potential by addressing some of the underlying uh, concerns. One of the biggest concerns from the government perspective is uh, the, the low productivity. If we look at the hectare and what we're producing, then you don't need to to, to go far to see that the productivity is a, a real big issue. And uh, the productivity is uh, an aspect of, uh, of course, uh, inputs, which cost money, and uh, all the costs which go with the production. And this is where the returns to the farmers become very important for us to unlock that potential. So productivity needs to be addressed. We are in the process of putting together a national strategy which uh, highlights uh, some of these issues and uh, looking for partnerships both within the industry and without both private pub public partnerships so that we can address those issues. I'm happy to note that some of the players in the coffee industry, private sector, are actually also involved in some degree on the production side and that needs to be escalated. Uh, mainstreaming of uh, best uh, and sustainable practices within the value chain so that we can remain sustainable. One year we don't produce 35 and the next year we are producing 50. I mean, it, it, it needs to be done. We, we have uh, the research station which really has a lot of uh, information and that can uh, improve. Then we need to rationalize the roles of uh, the public and private sector agencies in the coffee industry. Most of the industry, I would say, it's uh, really in the hands of the private sector, with uh, us in the coffee board as a really uh, regulator, facilitator, uh, and promoter. And uh, the, the, there is there's quite a bit, again, which needs to be looked at in that whole area. And one of the issues I'm saying is us spearheading, as a government, a national strategy. Uh, then the issue of uh, enhancement in the investment in the coffee industry, especially in the coffee growing areas. Actually, both in the existing areas where the productivity is an issue, and also in the emerging coffee areas in the West. I don't think we've uh, I've been to any forum 
where we've uh, celebrated coffee from the western region, the way I saw us doing here, the, the Bungoma area. So there's, there's a potential to explore and uh, innovate and come up with other uh, coffees from the different, very diverse area, which is the Kenya coffee, uh, I mean, growing areas, especially in the west of the lift, which has not been explored in, the, uh, for in a long time. And uh, if we do this, then, uh, uh, and of course, they're uh, investing also in, uh, in, in the local market. Uh, we've seen the growth test, uh, fastest growth of uh, coffee shops within the last uh, couple of years, and that, that shows also the potential for internal market. And as, as we do that, of course, we'll, we'll be conscious that we still want to keep our markets uh, alive. And th that needs to be done by external uh, co collaboration. Then uh, just uh, that's my contact address for any further engagement. And uh, I want to say Asante Sana. Asante means thank you in Kiswahili. So thank you very much. So we, uh, we, I was asked to sort of lead the panel discussion. I'm not going to say a lot of things. I'm going to ask some questions that uh, we have gotten in from some of you. Uh, but before we start, I would like you to introduce yourselves. And what's your name and what you actually do? All right, so my name is Matthew Dax. I work with Taylor Winch, which is part of the Vol Cafe group, um, trading coffees in Nairobi. It's been, I've been in East Africa for about four years now, and this is um, my first year with Taylor Winch. So. Yeah, I'm uh, Morten from Nordic Approach. Uh, yeah, mo I guess most of you saw my presentation yesterday, so I'm not gonna say too much, but we're a green bean importer based in Oslo. Start again. <laughs> Justin Archer, uh, representing the Ecom Group in East Africa. Been living in Nairobi for eight years. Was sent there to set up the uh, coffee operation for my, uh, my group in 2004. Okay, so just to get the debate rolling. Uh, we have a very good question here. Uh, I noticed, uh, I took some notes, uh, the auction system started in 1935. Uh, it was a governmental auction as far as I know. And the question is, why has the Kenyan auction system been so successful and why hasn't it been adapted by neighboring countries in Africa? Yeah, I can jump in there. I mean, I can answer the first part of the question more easily than the second part, perhaps. Um, I mean, the auction system is a very competitive way of buying coffee. We have, as, as Louise said, about 80 to 90 registered exporters in the country. Every Tuesday, we get together in a forum just like this, and we bid against lots of coffee. Even though there's only about sort of 20, 30, 40 active exporters week in, week out, it's a very competitive way of, tra of trading coffee. It's a fantastic price discovery mechanism for farmers because every single person in the industry can monitor the price of every single individual lot of coffee. So prices are well known, trends are well, well observable. Um, and I think that transparency and that competitiveness obviously drives the price upwards. Um, I'm, I'm in no doubt in my mind that if we did not have the auction in Kenya, the price of Kenya coffee would probably be substantially lower. So the, the auction has been very key in cementing Kenya's position as a, as, as a, as a unique quality proposition. I mean, high prices you know, tend to, tend to lend more to the notion of high quality, I think, um, and therefore it's been very successful. Why it's not adopted by other countries, I think, is an open question. Um, we have some examples in the region, like Tanzania, which is almost a mirror image of the Kenya system. Ethiopia is dallying with different versions of it. Um, we've had auction systems in the past in Burundi. I mean, they, they've been more or less successful. Um, Kenya, for some reason, has got it absolutely right. 
probably their higher quality has, has helped that to some extent. Um, I would just, one of the things that I would add is, is one of the things that makes the auction system so competitive is that the marketing agents who are working on behalf of the farmers uh, supply samples to all of the exporters two weeks ahead of, ahead of time. So we have an opportunity to cup every individual lot that is coming to the auction. Um, that can be upwards of 600 lots. Uh, we can cup them, we can do a green bean evaluation and really have a good idea of, of the value of that coffee. And so when we get to the auction hall and we're sitting in those seats, um, we all know the same information about that lot. We all know how that, that coffee can be used. And so we're, that, that also, I think, helps to push the price of, of the coffee up, especially for the higher quality coffees, um, because they will, they will stand out in the cup to all of the exporters and, and people will bid uh, higher amounts for those coffees. So maybe to add that they are also not side shows. So all the coffee, according to the law, comes to the central market. So a, a producer wanted wanting their coffee, they would need also to come and bid. So it really makes it really competitive, open, transparent, and uh, yeah, uh, and also traceable. The issue of traceability. And the only thing I have to add is the quality again is key. I mean, I think the the SL varieties, the historic quality in Kenya. It's very different. If you're looking even at the ECX system in Ethiopia, um, it's much more treated like a commodity. And so there's much less upward pr price recognition as you see in Kenya. So I think that the, the quality is key to the auction system being so successful. Just before we give Alejandro a question, uh, and from a buyer's perspective, Morten, is, uh, you're sort of on the other end. Uh, in your opinion, what's the sort of benefit of dealing with the uh, auction system in Kenya, uh, for instance, compared to Ethiopia or Burundi or? No, I mean, like they, they said, it makes kind of a uh, lot selection from each and every supplier very easy. And the thing is also that um, you can buy all kind of lot sizes. Uh, it's all from, what is it now, like 10 bags and upwards. Um, so, I mean, from a, from a quality standpoint, it's, it's really easy to buy different qualities, different micro lots. Um, and uh, like I say, the, the better coffees are getting rewarded in the system. So, um, I mean, that said, it can, I mean, I was supposed to talk about the positive things, but I mean, there is also challenges because um, you can, let's say you want to build a relation with the cooperative, um, if everything is going into the auction, it can be hard to, uh, to consistently buy that coffee over years because you can lose it to an exporter you don't work with or stuff like that. So I mean, for me, it's, it's both good and bad and uh, that's why we are doing both the, the second window and occasionally the auction, but more and more just the second window actually. Second window being the direct trade, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Alan. Thank you. Um, following on the uh, Words you have said that is an open, transparent, uh, fair, good price discovery mechanism. Why then uh, you come up with the alternative direct uh, uh, sales mechanism? That's the first part of the question. The second part, um, you said that there are 40 active players, and uh, I forgot your name idea, but, but uh, you said that there are four uh, key market players, which seems to be the four big guys, the e coms and things like that. So is it not a little, little like a very small club to have all that beauty? Uh, maybe just to correct that, uh, the, the, the key players are 40. I said four zero, yeah, not four, out of the big number. So the real active ones, the ones who fight every day, every Tuesday. Uh, then, uh, yeah, it, it's transparent and uh, I think it's always good to look at another way of doing things. So the, the fact that uh, we have a direct sales and it has not undone, you know, or everybody has not run away. So that still attests to the fact that the direct sales, I mean the auction is still good. Because we, we were thinking in government that uh, when we set up the direct sales, everybody was going to run away. But uh, the, the auction still remains the price discovery system. And so it's still a benchmark also, even as we, 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 we go the direct way. I think to add um, why the second window or direct sales, I, there's a, a lot of different reasons. I think um, 
certification, the growth of certification has been a big reason for that. So we have a lot, we work with a lot of uh, roasters that actually want certified coffees and are actually willing to help support. Um, we work together with Peter and, and CMS to help support farmers to obtain that certification. And it's much easier to do if you have a direct relationship with that producer group. So a vast majority of the coffees that we trade directly are certified coffees. So the growth in that, in that sector has been a, a real cause for that. But to reiterate what Luis said, that the, the ability to have both, it allows you to be able to sell direct but use that as a benchmark as well. So I think, um, I think that it's really important that you're able to have both systems. Again, in Ethiopia, with the ECX, it's been challenging to be able to trade certified copies in the last few years because of that. Yeah, I had uh, one question, just so you can see me. Uh, I moved to Kenya like 10 months ago, and since I moved, uh, the dollar has dropped around 20%. And I was just wondering, now that the prices are set in dollars, what does this mean for the individual smaller farmers? Where How has that been compensated, or how have they been hit by this, that, you know, losing 20% of their income within a year? Yeah, I mean, in actual fact, if you, arrived in, if you arrived in Kenya 10 months ago, you arrived at a time when the, the exchange rate was 20% up from the historical average. So if I'm not mistaken, the exchange rate we have today in Kenya is about the same as it was when I came there eight years ago. So I think you, you're, you arrived at a time when there was, a, there was an unforeseen peak. And so maybe the, the analysis is not quite correct. Yeah. What we did in anticipation of uh, the, the, the inevitable, because we knew the Kenya shilling was not going to remain at that high, it was unusually high, it was uncomfortable for the entire economy. So, so we, we, we had a lot of education for farmers. But of course when it hits you, that's when farmers realize, uh, oh, it's real and you know, they, they've, there's a quite a bit of uh, discontent. But uh, again, education, we're trying to show them and compare with what is happening internationally. We were still, in uh, June, we, we did an analysis and we were at about 25% below the what, what we were the other year compared to the rest of uh, the the, the mouths which were at about forty percent. So so we were still trying just to encourage them so that they stay afloat. All right. One of the things that I reasons why I uh, started going to Kenya is that I paid for some coffee and I heard by the exporter uh, that knew uh, the society that uh, the farmers didn't get paid. Uh, but one of the benefits uh, with the second window and also the auction system is it makes transparency a lot easier. Uh, can someone sort of explain a little bit how, how does that transparency model work? I mean, how can I as a buyer get to know that the farmers are actually getting paid? Well, I'll start and then pass it off. But I think uh, the transparency is a critical part in Kenya. And actually, we were just costing this week, again, back to certification, we were costing the, how much it costs us to support farmers to get certified. And that's gathering documentation, it's um, putting in water meters, uh, doing uh, soil analysis, doing all the things that are required to, to be able to get a farmer ready for, for certification or transparency or general sustainability. And because the co-ops are so organized in, in Kenya, uh, there's documentation with regards to every farmer at every co-op. Uh, it's actually significantly cheaper to be able to conduct those activities uh, in looking at that, that shows the transparency. I mean, inherently within the cooperative system, you have complete transparency from the auction or direct sales back to the cooperative society, back to all the way back to the farmer. So how much the, the cooperative society, society takes out, um, an overview of the debts. So it's completely transparent in that way, which as a group for us working in places like Rwanda or Ethiopia, you don't have that open transparency. So you do know, um, where the where the price goes and where the um, the percentage of the total FOB price, you can find out where it goes to the farmer. One of the things that's very different in Kenya, uh, and I'm open to almost opening another debate, um, is that in in Rwanda, for instance, a farmer will get um, paid immediately for their cherry, um, and so a wet mill or even a co-op will have to have cash advance, a significant amount of cash to be able to run their wet mill for that season. Um, but the farmer gets cash for their product right there. In Kenya, um, because of the way that the auction system is structured, they get paid seven, eight, nine months later than um, when their coffee is sold to the auction. I think it's a, it's a chicken and the egg situation. 
um, I think the good news is that you don't have to have credit. I think credits can be a very, very bad thing for farmers because it's a burden. It's, a, it's something that, uh, again, historically, Latin America, the rest of Africa, farmers have huge debts and they actually end up going out of business because of that. So in a way, this protects Kenyan farmers, um, but they also do have to wait a little bit longer to be able to get uh, the price for their coffee. already picking the next, the next cup. The, the thing that I would add to that as well, um, in terms of transparency, one of the things that, that I don't think gets talked about enough, which is I, I think pretty unique to Kenya, is that the farmer owns the coffee all the way through the system. So the farmer will own the coffee until it's sold to an exporter uh, at the auction system or through, through the whole milling process. So they actually are working more on a service provider model where each of the different people in the supply chain, they're not taking ownership of the coffee. The coffee is still in the hand, is, is still owned by the farmer. They're just providing a service. So the dry mill, uh, when, the, when the cooperative societies deliver their coffee to the dry mill, the dry mill isn't buying that coffee and then selling it at the auction. They're just simply providing a service. So that, again, enables uh, a different level of transparency than you would find in, in a lot of different uh, coffee growing origins. Maybe just to re react to the, to the period. Uh, according to the analysis and that we, we have, uh, we've moved from nine months to three, at most four months, in terms of the turnaround time yeah? for, for the, through the auction. And especially, of course, when we have big volumes, that, that can take a little longer because it means queuing, uh, uh, you know, to get into the auction. But with the kind of volumes we've had, uh, the, it, it's really faster. Three to, to, to four months would be like it. Actually, it'd be the higher side there. Can I ask, uh, I mean, from my experience in, in Kenya, um, I kind of see the farmers are kind of gamblers. They like to, I mean, you can offer them a pretty good price, but still they would like to see where the auction goes and they're all, always hoping for more. I mean, this, the, the system you're talking about now where, where the farmers are actually the owners of the copy until it's uh, sold, could they be potentially be better off if they were working, you know, in a different way with the exporter and they buy, kind of buy or hedge their coffee earlier? Um, not taking risk on, on market drops? I think my, my response to that would be it, it's a new area and uh, they, they, they are, okay, we, we are all gabblers in life. <laughs> we would like to maximize on everything. And uh, it's a new way of doing business and uh, when you sit down and you really uh, agree with them, uh, really they get out of that. But there is uh, some fears you know, farmers not want to get into it because they don't know what the auction is going to be like. There's some unfound, uh, some fears, but those ones who I know who have, uh, at least who I've worked with, the, 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 once they commit, then they go on to it. But you see more of fear of not wanting to commit for the fear of the unknown. <laughs> just like sometimes they just hold the coffee and not uh, present it to the market, hoping that the prices are going to turn around. So, so those things happen. Then to come back on the model of... Uh, of paying the farmers uh, later, I mean, uh, as opposed to after the, the Rwandan model, uh, we have the Coffee Development Fund, one of the key public uh, uh, institutions which is uh, uh, entrusted with financing the industry. They are in the process of relooking their products because they've come up with the products which maybe are not uh, suitable to the farmers, but uh, it's becoming apparent that uh, a model which uh, supports the farmers in terms of payments in advance may stimulate more interest and even more production as opposed to waiting you know, to give farmers for inputs uh, later on. Yeah, I was just gonna add in terms of the, the sort of risk management element to, to pricing. I mean, obviously if you know, someone like uh, Nordic Approach comes to your farm and offers you a price for coffee, you're gonna take that price because it's gonna be a good price. But for the majority of the crop, I mean, our advice to the farmers, and I'm sure it's the same for, for Peter with his farmers, is you know try and try and hedge your risk by spreading your sales. Don't sell all your coffee in one go in one auction. The best approach is always to try and sell that coffee over a period of two or three months, and you're going to average out the movements of the market and, and, and the movements in, in supply and demand. So that is really the only the only advice you can give in terms of managing price risk. I think. And I was just going to add uh, that. 
buying and selling coffee is sort of inherently there's there's a an, an edge of gambling to it depending on what's happening with the market so to your point i don't think there is an advantage or disadvantage to um to using the auction system as opposed to selling your coffee directly to an exporter i think um you know there are different risk management strategies as justin was talking about um, and that's really where the second window and direct export can sort of come into play because you, you will usually come in and, and offer an outright price, right? Whether it's um, $10 a kilo or something as opposed to a differential um, where, where, they, where the farmers are much more subjected to the movements of the market. All right, we got some uh, questions. Uh, first one that uh, we have gotten on an email. Uh, is there a gap between, uh, in quality between uh, the coffees traded direct and the coffees traded in the auction? Like, is there a big gap in the quality between those two trade models? I mean, really, they're, they're one and the same in, in most cases. So um, a, a cooperative can put part of his coffee through, their coffee through uh, the auction and sell part of it direct. So it's, uh, you know, generally, no. I mean, I would say that you can get fantastic coffees in the auction and you can get fantastic coffees depending on your relationship direct. So I, don't, I don't know if you have any. Well, I think it's also driven by you guys. I mean, you know, the, the more you guys want direct trade coffee, the more we're going to push better qualities to the direct trade. That's also inevitable. So, um, you know, the farmers and the market agents are reacting to, to, to market situation as well. And uh, as, as Chris was saying before, the majority of coffee that's actually sold through the direct trade model is, is certified coffees. Um, and so that, that necessarily isn't having a huge impact on quality, but what does happen, and this is something else that Chris and I were talking about yesterday, is when you're selling coffee through the, through the, the, the second window, um, when Morton is coming to buy coffee direct from the, from the producer, he's buying their best coffee. Yeah? So what ends up happening is that they, they uh, have to sell the rest of their coffee through the auction system. Um, and so I don't know what the sort of outcome is with that or the dynamic and how that affects the, the sort of overall or average price that they get. Um, but I, I don't think there's a, a huge impact on quality, at least at this point. If it, if it becomes much larger uh, than the 10% that it is, uh, then, then there, there's potential for that, sure. Like, like I indicated, for, for you to qualify or to really embrace the direct sales, there need to be a, fr a price differential. So, so that is driven, and what then it would translate to, it means it could be the higher quality coffees. But like uh, uh, Acha says, uh, the volumes won't be limited to how much the, the buyers are looking for. So inevitably, the, the rest of it goes through the auction. So you'd have the two, uh, even same lots or uh, same qualities, uh, being in the different places, both in direct and in the auction. But I mean, I was still just like a small comment to this. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and I think in general it's it's the truth. But it's also, I think there is, from what I see, there is a number of factories that are more attractive than others. And uh, I would say that the top lots from these factories, in many cases, never reaches the auction. Uh, so I think that uh, the way I see it, it limits kind of, Let's say CMS have a coffee and they're taking it out of the, on the, of the catalog. It limits your access to that same coffee. So whoever works with you wouldn't be able to buy, buy that specific, the top lots from the same. So, you know, it's, I'm just saying it, it is, it can be kind of challenging as well in terms of the very top ones, but maybe not in, in general terms. From well, and I, I, I would uh, just, I think you're right, but I think the, what it does is limits the relationship. So it's not necessarily the top coffees. Um, I think, uh, you know, and this is my sort of personal opinion, I think quite often um, societies can develop a good reputation uh, and they start developing relationships with people and, and those coffees are seen as the top coffees. Um, but, but you will see um, just as many great coffees coming into the auction system from different cooperatives that might not have the same reputation. Um, and so what it, what it does is it limits the ability to have that relationship, I think, yeah. Uh, hey guys, uh, Noah, Cafe Imports here. Uh, just wondering if you guys could speak to the uh, logistical challenges of getting coffee out of K 
Kenya. I mean, I know that we're all pretty aware that uh, logistics in East Africa in general can be challenging. I'm just wondering if there's any unique to Kenya. From, from my experience, I would say that uh, Kenya is one of the easier places to get coffee out of. Um, the, the, the big logistical problems that we run into could be port delays, um, but the, you know, there's, there, there's generally two ways that we'll move coffee to the port, um, and that's either through the highway, through the Mombasa Highway, uh, or on rail. Um, we move almost all of our coffee by rail, and, and we never have an issue with, with getting coffee to the port on time. Whether or not the port is operating as efficiently as it could be is a, a different story. Um, but in terms of, of East Africa, I think Kenya is one of the easier places to get coffee out of. But maybe someone else wants to touch on that. I, I know that uh, Mombasa has made significant uh, infrastructure improvements, and they've also started operating 24 hours, I believe. And so over the last couple of years, I mean, I remember about three years ago, there was um, real problems and delays in Mombasa, but it's improved a lot. And it is, I've had no issues over the last two years. I don't know about it. No, I agree. I think Kenya is one of the easier in East Africa, but you, you're absolutely correct to know that uh, you know, Africa is not, not the easiest place to get coffee from. I mean, I still think that the cost of getting the coffee from Nairobi to Mombasa, which is about 500 kilometers of road, is almost as much as getting the coffee from Mombasa to Europe. So, you know, the, it's, it's, even if the logistics are fairly short and, and getting better, the costs are still astronomical. Uh, and if you were going to go further inland to, say, Uganda or Rwanda, I mean, the cost far exceeds the cost of, of, of the sea freight. So that is a challenge for, for the buyers, of course. And yeah. I think uh, part of the competitiveness uh, for us, you know, as a dest I mean, as an origin, not just in coffee, really lies in us improving our infrastructure, including the rail system and all. And uh, the government is on top of that because he's right that the cost of that short distance need not be the cost of coming to Europe. You know how much we pay by air to come here, and how much we pay by road to go to Mombasa. So really, it's top on the agenda. Uh, including uh, those of you who, I don't know, they've heard about the, the Lapset. We, we, we have a second port coming up and uh, really opening up. But before that is, of course, done, then the uh, deepening in terms of uh, services of the existing port is, is on course. And, of course, the, the road system. All right. We're running a little bit over time, but we have one last question from uh, this girl over here. Um, I was working with a cooperative um, a few years ago that... Uh, um, was in a society that didn't think that they were getting their fair dues. Um, they, they sort of realized that once they were selling directly, they had liquid gold, um, and, um, or so they thought. And there was, a, there was a rift between them and the society, and I just thought, to ask you, since 2006, since the direct market really sort of opened up, um, have you seen more of that instance, like instances in that case? And do you think that that's going to keep continuing the more Specialty coffee buyers around the world are, are starting to go through the direct window instead of the, uh, the auction system. Yeah, I think since um, the market, uh, the, the second window came up, uh, we, we can see there was a, there is a bit of uh, more transparency. We have not seen much breakup. We have um, uh, societies, I can name some of them, like the RICO, our unit society, which, which is getting better, bet, better, co better quality, and even giving the farmers the better pay. The, according to, to, the, to the Coffee Act, farmers are supposed even to get 80% of the gross, gross, gross sales, but some of these units now are even paying 91%, which is which is better, it's improving by, by the day. So I believe, yeah, we, 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 it's the, 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 the second window is actually now pushing things better to the, to, the, to the benefit of the farmers, yeah. I think something too, to your point, and I don't know if that answered your question or not, but uh, is the structure of the system. So um, farmers are organized into cooperative societies and those societies can have several, uh, they can have a single factory or wet mill, uh, or they can have several. Um, and I think maybe what you're talking about is one of the factories getting a higher price by selling their coffee direct as opposed to the others. And then member farmers of the cooperative, the larger society, maybe getting jealous. Is that sort of, was that the problem?
for uh, sorry for um, you know for buyers who who would like to continue working with societies um, and um, and and factories in in particular uh, it it kind of disrupts our our marketing flow as well so um, just if that's going to con continue to happen in, in the future uh, and if like if you if you project that that to be happening in, in greater instances I think from uh, the government point of view, uh, I would say that uh, the Kenya, there is a lot of transparency in almost every area of uh, doing business and uh, the cooperatives have not been left behind. Through a uh, European Union project which ended last year, we introduced what we are calling uh, prudential standards, you know, standards of management or by which the cooperatives are being uh, subjected to so that they can change their way of doing business. Corporate societies by their very nature and uh, we, 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 had, we, we know that the cooperative uh, movement uh, started in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, they, 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 like they, they, they were seen like they were social outfits as opposed to entrepreneurial, and now that is what is being uh, brought back into the management of corporate societies. And uh, they, they are also going to be put through what we call management, uh, uh, performance management uh, co contracts, something like that, so that they can be made to account alongside the standards which are set out, part of it which is uh, transparency and the overall governance of, of the societies. Uh, uh, there will be need for a bit of investment in the societies, especially in the weighing scales, because uh, that's one area which has been uh, highlighted as a possible area of uh, misuse, where, where the weighing scales, the manual weighs, weighs, weighing scales, can be manipulated or misinformation can be misrepresented. Uh, but the automatic, you know, automated uh, weighing skills directly connected to a computer then uh, becomes the way to go. And a number of them have uh, piloted that. Great. You know what, guys? Thank you so much. Let's have a big round of applause. So, so interesting. Really, really appreciate it. I wish we could keep going and going because it is fascinating. Thank you again.